Good evening, members. Ninjani. Hi, Tina. I hope everybody um, can hear us clearly uh, and be able to see us. I am so excited because the opportunities and chances of ha having Hicksonia available and to be able to spend just some time with us in conversation is unprecedented in my view. And I wanted to say that when I looked at the topic, it says we want to recognize, you know, the work and achievements that you've had, Sonia. And in terms of tribute, I said, oh, is there something we're going to do? And I was told the tribute really is for all of us in this webinar to just have a chance to say, we see you rise, we see you rise high, we see you shine. And we want to say to you, um, shine where you are and continue rising. And we're all holding on uh, to, your, to your pinnacle tales, if I were to say so. Let me just, um, before I start um, introducing Hicksonia, we all think we know her, but there's so much more that we actually don't know about her. And um, we will make sure that there is time later on to pick up questions on the chat. We think it should be easier if you have a, a question, a comment or anything, please put it on the chat so that we don't have too much disruption uh, with, with, with the webinar. Who's Ixonia? Ixonia is a businesswoman and an entrepreneur who's developed a very, very wide international reputation as a board member with integrity and drive. And if, I know that some of you probably lost touch with her sort of during the days at Unilever. Yes, she was at Unilever. And she has since founded many successful companies. She was rated by the Financial Maid amongst the top three most influential women in business in South Africa. Before founding Ayavuna in 2004, she ran for 20 years the TH Nyasulu and Associates, a strategic marketing and research company that she started in 1984 after working at Unilever. Her clients included retail companies, manufacturing companies, FMCG and tourism companies, as well as a few municipalities in South Africa. His Sonia is a highly ex experienced non-executive director with now over 30 years of listed company experience. On the JSE, on the London Stock Exchange, on the New York Stock Exchange, on Euronet in Amsterdam. She attended the international program for board members at the renowned IND in Switzerland which exposed her to corporate governance models in various countries. Hicksonia has served on the, on the boards of blue chip companies, not only in South Africa, but in, in the UK and Europe. She counts amongst her former directorships, the board of Anglo Platinum Limited, the world's biggest platinum producer, Unilever PLC, and NV, NetBank Limited, where she even became the deputy chair, the JP Morgan South Africa Advisory Board. She was director of Sussel Limited for seven years and led the company as the chair for five years. From 2008 to 2013, at the time, Sussel Limited was South Africa's biggest company by market cap. She's currently non-executive director of London listed Anglo-American PLC, a non-executive director of Agra and chair 
uh, of its subsidiary, the African Enterprise Challenge Fund. The latter two are actually based um, in Nairobi until July, 2022. She was also senior independent director and en employee engagement champion for London listed Vivo Energy PLC. Hixona was born in South Africa in 1954, has an honors degree in psychology from the University of Zululand. She also holds an executive leadership development program certificate from the Arthur D. Little Management Education Institute, which is now known as the Howard Business School in Massachusetts in the, um, in, in the US. She served as a member of the Banking Inquiry Panel appointed by the South African Competition Commission to investigate the charges in the retail banking sector, as well as access to the national paying system and competition in the banking sector. We all remember what that was like because it made huge changes in, in banking. She was a founder member of the advisory group formed by the World Economic Forum to set up a community of global chairs and to design a program and agenda for the inaugural gathering of chairs um, in France in 2013, where she also led one of the discussion topics. I think we must say shine, shine, Sonia, shine. <laughs> Anyway, um, when I looked at the topic of lift as you rise as part of celebrating and paying tribute to you, I just thought it would be nice to be able to just lead this conversation with a few questions and in line with us picking some, I don't know, uh, the, the, the best of your, your knowledge and experience in your career across you know, the JSE, the London Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange and Euronet. And so I hope you are okay if I can lead with just a few questions. Maybe let me give you a chance to say hi to the members. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm really excited about being with you. I was saying to Tina earlier, that any chance to be in the presence of members, whether virtually or physically, uh, is a chance that I would not let go. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. And I hope, you know, thank you for the time you're taking to celebrate my journey. But I also am here to celebrate all of you members and anybody else who has joined because you're formidable women you're a, you're a group of just the most formidable people and i hope we can use this session to learn from each other thanks tina oh thank you very much i want to start from when you were you know a member at inanda you know and probably remember walking from the chapel going to the classes and 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 walking down uh, that that jacaranda driveway that we, we, we had at Inanda. As a member, as you finish your metric, did you actually have a clear plan for your career reaching, reaching such heights? And I know this is not the end because there's more to actually expect from you. What was yeah. it like as a young member? I, you know, for starters, it, it was awesome. I mean, I'd, I think anybody who had come from a school in the township and suddenly found themselves in just these amazing, beautiful uh, premises and the environment and just the decorum. And I, I just have to mention the decorum because, you know, you looked at the people who were senior to you and mm. your, your dream was, I want to be like them when I get to matric. But just the structure that Inanda Seminary gave to our lives, uh, particularly to someone who came from a big family and I was the eighth child in a family of nine. So 
I, I honestly had no structure. My older sisters did everything for us. And just being able to be put in a position where you have to stand on a two feet. And I often tell my friends that the biggest culture shock was Friday or Saturday, the first one when people were taking laundry and going. And I was thinking, I expected to do my own washing uh, because I'd grown up in an environment where my sisters were, were doing that. You know, my mom would always be are the kids' uniforms ready. So being at Inanda was, was really awesome. But to come to the question that you ask, and I'm sure I'm not the only person who's asked the question, did you have a plan for your career? Did you see where it would go? And, and honestly, I have to say, anyone who knew when they passed metric what their plan was for where they would be at this point in time is a better person than me. I'm just not that structured, not that organized to have had some kind of perfect plan. So really depending on what your belief system is, for me, yeah. I really do believe that there was, a, of course I knew I had some kind of plan and my plan was simple as I don't ever want to do maths and physical science again. That was <laughs> the extent of my, my plan. So anything that I chose was based on, I don't want to do those things. But I honestly also thought I could do something for others, for people, having watched my mother, who was a teacher and, and a great community worker. Uh, and so social work really resonated with me. It didn't mm -hmm. have math and science, but it was a kind of do good mm -hmm. career as well. So it was either I was going to practice as a social worker or as a psychologist, but the reason I say there's a greater force uh, that directed my journey is I didn't end up there. I graduated as a social worker and I had an honors degree in psychology, but never really practiced because my direction took a, a very different turn. And it, it started with a lecturer by the name of uh, Mrs. Nondumiso Lamini, who, you know, told recruiters from Unilever when they came to recruit that there's a student she would like them to talk to. And I was very unwilling because I, I knew that I could line up a job as a social worker, but I didn't want to disappoint her because she really was one of my biggest sponsors and supporters. And, and she was a very tough, yes, woman. And I knew that I would never hear the end of it if I didn't go to this interview, and I did. And I didn't even know what I wanted to do. I remember one of the questions said, which department do you want to be placed in if you're successful? And I asked one of the girls next to me, you know, what are you writing? And she said, just, <laughs> just put marketing. And I said, what's marketing? And she said, just write it down. So I did, and I ended up in the marketing department of Unilever, and, and so my journey ended. So in brief, I honestly wouldn't have said to you when I passed my trick that my dream mm -hmm. is to be in the marketing department of, of Unilever is other things conspired to put me on that trajectory. And one of them was, was having a lecturer uh, by the mm -hmm. name of on so that that is the brief answer wow that that's actually quite amazing so you were more open to how can i say open to what life have to offer but yeah. actually trusting that anybody who was giving you direction or opportunity had the best interest for you absolutely yeah absolutely that, that's actually quite interesting because we, we never thought Magdalene with all the structure, she actually meant the best for us either. <laughs> and, and, and I will come to the Inanda Seminary uh, experience and, yes. and how it also contributed to that journey as well. Okay, great. So let me just ask you, um, how did you then manage to rise? Uh, and I want to say, so you walk into Unilever to do marketing, which you haven't thought about what it actually means. 
And within very few years, you've started your own marketing research and strategy uh, business that, that is able to, to actually have an impact in many businesses and municipalities. So how, 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 do you, how do you think of that? And if you are sharing this, obviously, as you share it with us, how do you think you manage to go through all these ranks? You know, and, and, and this is exactly where I want to go with, with the question you're asking me. I, I think there are two very big influences in your life that prepare you for certain things and certain journeys you have to take. And, and one was really the, the, the basic uh, values and background that my parents gave and, mm -hmm. and grounded in you, you know, values such as honesty and integrity and, you know, being of service to others, learning to share, uh, but also getting to Inanda Seminary. And remember that a job in marketing requires certain skills. First of yes. all, a proficiency in English, because mm -hmm. you're presenting, you're putting your point across, you're, you're arguing in, in a meeting uh, with people about why things should be done in a certain way, both from a creative perspective, but also from a strategic perspective. Mm. But you're also having to write quite a lot of proposals as well. So mm. if I hadn't had the language rule <laughs> at Nanda <laughs> Seminary, uh, which forced me to speak English from Sunday evening till Friday evening, basically. Um, and, and, you know, having, having actually done my primary, primary school in the medium of Setswana, because mm -hmm. I grew up on the West Rand where everybody really speaks uh, the Sotho languages and Setswana, mostly with a few Kosa and Zulu, but mostly the, the Sotho and Zwana languages. Coming to Inanda and suddenly, you know, I had English as a subject at primary, but having to speak the language daily mm -hmm. made a huge difference. But then there were other things like how your confidence was built, the ability to carve out a space for yourself, the ability to freely ask questions without feeling that you will, would be judged or sound stupid. And, and I have to say being in an all girls school, you know, I don't know if, you know, the, the other members who followed us will, will, or who were with me will remember how we used to tease the girls from uh, co-ed schools like Oshlang and Marion Hill. And we had a thing where we would say, Bazo Tina Bafan, you know, like what would the boys say? Yes. You didn't have that pressure at Inanda Seminary. You no. didn't have to think no. that a, a young man that you fancied or who fancied you might think, oh, I didn't know she's so stupid. <laughs> you were basically <laughs> amongst friends and in a risk-free environment mm -hmm. to make mistakes, to ask questions, the confidence just to, to speak up. But, but as I said, even growing up as the eighth child in a family of nine, you're really quite far behind. You are the youngest by one person. Yeah. So the ability to raise your voice to be heard, even if it meant throwing a tantrum, but you knew you had to create a space for yourself yeah. to be heard. Otherwise, you will always be in the background. And, you know, the, uh, the lady from Facebook who writes about, was it Facebook or Google? I can't remember, but she writes a book about leaning in and how yes. women Hmm. I find it really difficult to lean in. And, and the one thing that Inanda Seminary taught us was to lean in. Um, and, and Inanda girl wouldn't walk into a room and find the boardroom chairs empty uh, with some other chairs along the wall and choose the chairs along the wall. We're going <laughs> to walk right up to the table and sure. sit. And, and that's what leaning in is all about. You know, people who assume the chairs at the table are for other people. What Inanda taught us was that chair at the table is your chair. And so yeah. those are the skills that it, it, Inanda really helped me with in, in the job that I was, I was then to have. So it really helped with the journey. 
but it but it also helped you to understand that you don't have to live your life as though you were apologizing to someone mm. yes. for being a woman or being black or being young or being short or being dark or being light, whatever. Uh, you know, yeah. you have the confidence to be who you are and to be authentic about who you are and, and not try to be what you think people expect you to be. And that's that's a quality that I see in so many in under seminary girls that are, is, has, has just become synonymous with, with being a member is, is you will be who you want to be and, mm -hmm. and you don't live as though you apologize to other people for, for mm -hmm. who you are. Yeah, so I, I guess it was really very good uh, in, yeah. in that. Mm. So I was gonna say, I, I mean, so you mentioned your lecturer, you mentioned your parents, you mentioned I, in Nanda, but um, on your journey, um, have there been times where you you kind of feel like maybe most um, inexperienced directors would feel um, when they walk in, like, I don't want them to think, yeah, Papa, or I don't want them to think that I don't know anything. Um, so now you've taken the position around around the table and the 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 the, the board meeting starts um were, were there people who assisted you along that because i think there's a, a huge aspiration of you know yes you can be an executive yes you can be a ceo um or managing director but you know being on the board is still something that you know, number one, South Africa needs to get right because we need more women. And, um, but what helped you along that? The sort of people who lifted you along the ladder. And, and there are so many, Tina. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's a couple of weeks ago, I was making a list of people that I will want. And I think as you get older, you, introspect so much more and you look back and looking back at my journey and I was making a list of people that I would invite to kind of a thank you lunch if I mm. ever had one and I was amazed to see how many people those are the list just went on and on and on if my parents were still alive they would be top of that list I had teachers in that list I had journalists in that list I had people like my former boss uh, Caroline Cook at at, uh, at Lever Brothers when I was in the Lux office and arrived as a as an assistant and by the way a woman that I didn't want to work for because I had been working for a man and I you know when I was being told that you know the new senior brand manager coming to the Lux office was Caroline Cook, I thought, oh, not a woman. I, I, I just want to go. Because again, the stereotype of she's going to be difficult, she's going to try and keep me down. And Caroline Cook was the opposite of all of those mm. things. And, and she really, and, and because she didn't uh, kind of try and, and cover me and, and, uh, and, and, you know, speak for me and protect me, Caroline was the kind of boss who would say, okay, I want you to go represent the Lux office at this OPSCOM mm -hmm. meeting. And I want you to know the people around the table, for instance, will not want you there because OPSCOM was not reserved, was not mm -hmm. allowed uh, to have marketing assistance. It was for senior brand managers. And she said, well, Lux is not going to have a representative because I'm going off to Johannesburg, so you have to do it. But she spent time briefing me on each and every person in that room, who was a bigot, mm -hmm. who was a racist, who thought women uh, you know, can never get things right. And all she did was prepare me so that I went there ready mm -hmm. to defend the position of, of, of her brand. And she said, I want you to get come back with the best spot in the calendar for Lux's uh, promotions. And I secured each and every one of the slots 
that she wow. had wanted me to get. And 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 she was absolutely right. There were those people when you walked in who were thinking, what's a marketing assistant doing there? But again, you know what I said about Yinanda Seminary, the leaning in? My yes. boss had told me I had every right to go support her mm -hmm. at that meeting. So I didn't feel like I should, you know, stand at the back and that. But it's it's also people who, on the board, for instance, you know, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things people need to understand is your first board doesn't have to be a listed company or True. one of the big ones. I actually started my board life with, with NGOs, the community chest. They wanted someone to help them with marketing and, and I came in to help them. But what people don't realize is just the amazing network of mm. high profile, highly successful CEOs and chairs who sit on NPO boards. Yes. And I honestly would not have had the opening to South Africa's boards, let's start there, if I hadn't started with those NGOs. The second one was the Greater Durban Marketing Authority, mm. again, my my former boss, Theo Rodriguez, was going to chair it and I was invited to join it, but just the people around the table. And very mm. soon, because you're working so hard and all the things I said about confidence and that, you're speaking up, you're that, you know, one of them who was well known in those days, Terry Rosenberg, said to me as we were packing mm -hmm. up after a meeting, Hicksonia, just wait, I want to walk out with you. And that was the beginning of, you know, what do you do? And people are curious because they're thinking, how come she can contribute mm -hmm. so well at meetings? But Terry became one of those people, Brandt Pretorius, people who were really uh, good mentors and sponsors. And when I say mentor, I don't mean there was a program. Yes. Uh, <laughs> as we described mentor. Uh, I've never had a mentor that had scheduled time for me but it were, it's people who were available for me when I needed to ask questions. And then when I joined the first uh, listed company, uh, the family own that owned many of the shares or the majority of shares, uh, the company was chaired by Sidney Boswick and he was such a father figure. He would say to me, don't be afraid to ask them anything and I want you to give these guys a a problem and remember we brought you here I have a bunch of bean counters around the table I'm relying on you <laughs> to help with the strategy so to have someone who already says you've been brought in for a particular skill which nobody else has yeah. and and we have confidence that you can contribute so there have just been so many Tina when I started my consultancies all the journalists who were curious about who is this, is this black woman in 1984, age 29, Amazing. starting yes. a consultancy to consult to corporate clients. And so much was written about me, which actually also generated leads. And I had people who made sure that I, you know, I had uh, access to mm -hmm. accounts, people who invited me to come bring in proposals and who were not afraid to give me work to start off. So I'll, I'll stop at that point. <laughs> no, but it's actually quite interesting when, when you talk about um, the opportunities in terms of also people who were supporting and promoting you. Because I think post 94, we tend to pigeonhole people, you know? Yes, we pigeonhole, you know, women bosses. Um, and I'm sure, as you say, it was also one of those things that, but actually they can tend to be really great or pigeonhole, you know, I wanna say old white men, um, but at the same time, some of them are so well-meaning. Um, so as you enter into all these boards in, in, in different companies in different countries, what have been some of your challenges? I can imagine, yep. you know, in London as, 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 as a South African woman, you know, there's a particular stereotype people have. Um, 
so how, how, what, what have been the challenges and what has helped you overcome those? Right. I, I, I kind of anticipated that the question around challenges, I think when people ask you about challenges, it's, it's usually did the men conspire to hold you back? Yes. Did the white people, you know, you know, look down upon you and give you problems? Uh, did, you know, other women do this and did this happen? But I have to say to you, and I say this honestly, and I often say to people who say, come on, you surely you, you did have those experiences is, you know, you had a different journey. I had my journey. So, mm -hmm. you know, as they say, when it comes to writing the story of your life, you don't let anyone else hold the pen, the pen. Okay. Yeah. I'm holding the pen. It's my story. So, you know, that's what I experienced. Ironically, it's only mm -hmm. recently in 2017, when we uh, bought land in the Midlands, uh, a farm with a hotel on it, that I could say I had my first experience of feeling this is racist or this is sexist mm. and that. But in my career, and I, again, to a large extent, because it's a different kind of person who sits on a board. You know, mm. it's, it's people who have ascended in their own companies because they had tremendous emotional intelligence to start off with. Uh, the times also have changed so much that it is no mm. longer about being exclusive, but about being inclusive. inclusive yeah. So the environment was was very different uh, by, the, by the time I got to London and Europe. But even mm. starting where I started in, in South Africa, I honestly didn't have any of those challenges. And, and maybe what I projected uh, in mm. terms of the confidence and, you know, I'm not going to be around here as though I'm apologizing. I didn't mm. bring myself, you invited me. And, <laughs> and you know, Tina, as a board member, that there would have been a very detailed discussion about you before you're invited. Mm. And you're mm. not the only candidate that they were looking at when they invite you. So by the time you get that invitation, they have all agreed that you are the right candidate. So you walk in with that mm. confidence already. And, and I would say that for me, the, the biggest challenge really in my career and anywhere else has been time. Yes. Uh, you know, time to be uh, an absolute professional, time to be a wife, time to be a mother, and these days, time to be a grandmother. <laughs> uh, time is just such a luxury uh, when you are a woman pursuing a career and, and raising a family at the same time. So time for me has been the biggest challenge. The other mm. challenge, and, and, and let me just go back to the issue of, of race and gender. I, I never ever assume that something is done to me because I'm a woman or because I'm black. That's never my first assumption because there are just so many people who are horrible anyway to anyone. But the reason I also came to that conclusion was in my own journey, and I will mention these people because I, I know they are not in our circle and they would never be amongst us. But I worked in one of the brand offices when I moved from the Lux office to, to Caroline Cook, from Caroline Cook to mm. a guy called uh, Chris Duck in, in the Omo brand office. Mm. There were two assistants and we were by then assistant brand managers. And it was myself and a guy called Rion Dutoy, a white guy. Yeah. And let me tell you, our boss was as horrible to both of us <laughs> As, as to anyone else. You know, Rian and I had to talk to the, the PAs in those days to say, when he puts things out, it's the days of, I'm showing my age, it's the days of the in-tray and out-tray. <laughs> if people know what that is. If he puts anything in the out-tray, please put it in our in-tray. Because he was trying to leave us out of 
just knowing. So yes. when he was away and people phoned the brand office, we looked like these idiots because we had no idea what was happening. You know, somebody would phone and say from product development and say the product is at this stage and we want to know when you want to share you either a smell test or a taste test or that. And we had no idea. So again, he was doing it to both of us, a white male and a black female. <laughs> but my first year before I became an assistant brand manager, I worked with Neil Westerhoff. And it was mm. the first marketing manager who actually, despite the uh, recommendation of our respective bosses to be promoted to assistant brand manager, held us back because he said he hadn't heard enough table banging from Neil Westerhoff wow. and myself. So I've been aware that there have been, in my journey, other people mm -hmm. of other races, and I see it even now, yes. who suffer yeah. certain things. So you would, you would really have to have been quite overt in your racism for me to say this is racist, but I don't necessarily jump to that as, as racist. Mm -hmm. So the challenges have really been about keeping abreast of what is needed and happening in the journey that you have chosen because you never stop learning. And mm. there are times, and, and if I give you an example, when the whole social media thing started and companies were moving away from the traditional advertising, and I was on the Unilever board at the time, and, you know, the average age of a director is about 60, unfortunately, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're old, it's still very difficult to bring young people in uh, because of the risks and the governance and all the other things, you know, companies are trying, but it's not happening as quickly as it, it should. But we knew very little mm -hmm. about that. And, and all of us started telling our chairman that, you know, we, 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 we feel overwhelmed when the, uh, <laughs> the executives bring things to us and are trying to explain how, you know, we're not going to advertise on TV because, you know, we've had so many likes on this and you see, you're not thinking <laughs> likes, what have they got to do with anything? Mm -hmm. But you know, the challenge of saying, okay, I, I really need training in a particular division uh, area and either taking your own money and training mm -hmm. yourself in that area or asking the company to send you for, for a course. So keeping abreast of a world that changes very quickly is, is one of the biggest challenges yeah. I've experienced. As an entrepreneur, access to finance I have more ideas than I have funding for so <laughs> you know I wish there was someone to fund every idea that I have but also as a board member just it is becoming with all the ESG issues yeah. the challenge for instance now so late in your career to try to understand the issues around climate change and scope one emissions and scope two and scope three and how those are calculated and all of those things. And in the London environment, the, the new changes where in London now, if you are a company with more than 250 people, you have to account in your annual report on what we call employment equity here in South yes. Africa, they call BAME. So for, for people of, of color in the UK, but also you have to account, every board now has to have an employee engagement champion. And as you can read in, the, in my CV, I, I was asked, appointed one for Vivo Energy, but that means four times a year, someone from the board has to sit with employee representatives, and then you've got to account in your annual report as to yeah. how what you were hearing for the employees has impacted the decisions the board has made. So the world is changing so rapidly that unless mm. you are able, you have the time and the, the, the love of learning, uh, you're going to be left behind. And, and that's a constant challenge. It's just 
being relevant all the time as things change. Yeah, I, I suppose even for somebody like you, you know, managing your, your businesses, managing the boards and the companies, because, you know, those boards are very taxing. Yeah. And then sitting back and saying, you know, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, and I'm a grandmother. And just making sense of all that is, is actually, and also I still have to learn new things. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. so it must be, it must be a challenge. You must be very organized. <laughs> it's taxing. But, you know, it's remembering that you don't have to be superwoman. I had to lean on my husband quite a lot mm. over the years. I had to lean on friends. I often mm. tell people that, you know, and I don't even know if she's on this call. Sometimes I would call her and say, Mgane, I don't care where you are or what you're doing, but I will have a child sit standing on the pavement at Clifton mm. if, if you don't go pick them up because I can't get out. So you got to rely on other people, family, friends, you know, neighbors, mm. even sometimes if you have uh, good neighbors. But again, I come back to the issue I said about being a member. Yes. Is even today when I teach people in the seminars I run and workshops is never lie about where you're going. Don't say you are going to a dentist when you're going to your son's gala. Let them understand <laughs> that you have responsibilities as a mother. My son mm. has a gala. My son has a play, a play, and I've got to be here. And, and that has always been my stance is I will not lie. I won't make an excuse about mm. family obligations. And I remember when I joined the board of NetBank, I think it was two, 2002 or three or thereabouts, and you know, when you accept an invitation to join a board and you get their calendar, you haven't got the school calendar yet. Yes. And it so happened that my first meeting in January was going to clash with my son starting his first year in grade eight at Kersney College. And here I was with this dilemma, my goodness, it's my first board meeting and I'm going to miss it. And I called Chris Liebenbeck, who was chair of NetBank at the time. And I said, Chris, I'm sorry to do this to you. But, you know, when I got the NetBank board calendar, I didn't have the Kesney one. But now mm -hmm. the first board meeting is on the same day as my son starting at, at Kersney High School. And I said, I need to be there, you know, to drop him off, see how yeah. he settled. But importantly, I need to be back when he comes back from school in case there's been bullying. You know, boys will do yes. like those. And I said, I'm sorry, Chris, I, I just can't come. You know, there will be other NetBank board meetings. There will be only one day that he starts school for the first time, high school for the first. And his response surprised me. And sometimes we think people are going to judge you. And he said, there's no place I'd rather you wear. So just mm -hmm. take care of your family and, you know, you can always attend the next board meeting. And I did. And right through my career, it's saying to people, oh, you know what? I'm looking after my grandson on that day. You know, I, I declined a meeting with one of the AEC funders, which is the European Union, just the other day. And I said, mm, not that day because I'm looking for after my grandson so can we take later in the evening you know so it's just being honest relying and leaning on other people to help you as you go along yeah and do it i know some, yeah somebody says never lie about where you're going it's a, it's a great yeah. lesson and, and also somebody might just see you there can you imagine how embarrassing that would be uh, <laughs> to be caught out in a lie has got to be the worst thing that could happen to anyone, particularly in a business environment. So rather and, tell And them, people will remember that. Yeah, yeah, every time they'll remember it. Absolutely. Uh, I three asthmatic sons and I would say he had an asthma attack last night. I don't want to leave him alone today. So I can't come. Yeah. So it's just being honest about and, and being authentic about who you are. 
Yeah, no, I think that's very true. I mean, members, I said, if you, if you have any questions, please pop them through and I will read them. Because one of the things that I was thinking about is with every wonderful thing that we had um, at Inanda and that grounded us, um, are there any things that you wish you had been taught or things that you wish you knew uh, while you were at Inanda, you know? Number one, we complain too much about the food <laughs> and, and occasional um, experiences and the cold water and yeah, whatever. Yeah, cold but water. were those things really that important? Now that you look back, you wish what else could have been included because I, I, I think Pogazi and the board have to think about, you know, hearing us who are now many years away from Inanda saying, don't forget, this is what these young people need today for their future. Yeah. You know, there are areas where Inanda failed me. <laughs> and I will say, I wish they had taught us to swim earlier in our lives. And I'm so happy now that, you know, the new girls have a swimming pool, thanks to Mandu Shabalala Msimang and, and yes. her giving back to her alma mater. Uh, I wish I could have played the piano. I wish there had been French lessons. Uh, you know, there are all of those things, but more seriously, mm. I can't think of anything other than the things I told you about that Inanda prepared me with Mm. that I, I, I would wish they had done differently. And the reason I say that is everything that we, we learn is obsolete in a matter of 10 years. You know, the That's world true. moves so quickly that I could wish that they had taught me certain things, but they probably would have been obsolete because they wouldn't have thought of artificial intelligence and machine learning. They wouldn't have been able to teach me um, you know, about the importance of agriculture. They wouldn't have been able to teach you about climate change and all. Things just change too quickly. What I value about what they taught me, which sees you through all of those changes and the VUCA world in which we live. Um, mm. for, for people who don't know, VUCA stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, mm -hmm. and ambiguous. So I believe that Inanda prepared us to adapt to a VUCA world. And you hmm. cannot really replace that kind of education. So if you prepare your students to be agile, to be flexible, to be adaptable, to know how to, you know, pivot very quickly and learn very quickly to think on their feet. And there were a couple of things that, you know, maybe we thought were crazy when we were at hmm. Nanda, but things that taught us to think on our feet. And, and I remember some of the English teachers you to have an exercise where, you know, they would ask you to ask the whole class to complete a story, which hmm. they might start with a sentence that just says, and then there was darkness. And then say, Tina Mosery. And you've got <laughs> to take the story, think on your feet about and then there was darkness. And as we were sitting there, there was a nod, loud bang on the door. And then Balisa will take it and you build a story yes. without ever having been prepared for it. I think Inanda taught us the confidence, the ability to, to stand up, not to be afraid to say, hang on a minute, you're going too fast. Yes. Hang on a minute, I didn't understand what you said and and just just to illustrate how important that is when the city of durban asked me they had just shut down uh their old tourism authority because of corruption and all of that and i think deloitte or one of the auditors forensic auditors had said it's too rotten you can't fix it just shut it down and start it from scratch wow. and the city of durban approached me and said we have this issue would you come in uh, as executive chairman and build this tourism organization from start and put in a strategy and a point and they retrenched everyone so they gave me a clean slate to start from scratch obviously mm. i had the management skills i had the 
emotional intelligence. I had all this, I had the strategic uh, experience. I had the marketing experience. What I didn't have was tourism experience. And I was employing people who had been in tourism all their lives. I didn't even know what the acronyms meant. They would often say, you know, the mice industry, and I'd have to say, stop, what is mice? And somebody would <laughs> say, okay, meetings, incentives, conferences, and exhibitions. But yeah. the confidence you get from Inanda to say, I don't understand that. I don't know much about that. So go slowly. And I would make them mm -hmm. This was the convention bureau manager who's run a convention, how to bid for a conference. And, wow. you know, we had to bid for so many conferences because we had a new ICC and we had to fill up that calendar, the AIDS conference, you know, the Commonwealth heads of government meeting and mm. all of that. You are directing a team that knows more about the subject matter than you do but you're confident enough in the things that you have and the skills you have to be able to say that part, I know zilch about. So go slowly. <laughs> you're going to have to teach me about mm. tourism until you get to a point where you understand. So I'm happy for those lessons from Inanda because they, they will stand you in good stead. Uh, you will be thrown into environments. I'm working in agriculture these days, Tina. I knew <laughs> nothing about agriculture. And you know that that kind of meeting when I said there must be a higher power that directs certain things. My last board meeting at Unilever London, the person who had been elected to replace me and I had fought hard for them to replace me with another African because I was the only African on the mm. board. The rest of them were Swedish, German, whatever. Yes. Was Strive Masiwa. And, and, you know, Strive needs no introduction. He's mm -hmm. the Zimbabwean billionaire who started Econet and that. I had one meeting only that overlapped with Strive because as he was coming in, just before the AGM, my last board meeting and that, but when your contribution contribution in a meeting is so memorable to someone that when they sit somewhere else and someone mm. says, we need a person who can help us with this, they say, I met this woman and I yeah. think she would be great. It took one board meeting. But what it did was not only did it introduce me into an area that is so crucial and so critical because I don't know how many people realize and know I didn't know until I joined Agra and I'm sitting with agricultural scientists and biologists and that and I didn't know that there isn't a single developed country that got to where it it is now without like first that. getting agriculture right that's right true so it's clear that as Africa we're not really going to get far until we get our agriculture mm. And so I'm learning new skills. I'm reading up on agriculture. And so, you know, the point I was making is you've got to be willing to always learn new things. Yeah. It is getting new things, but also it all comes back to the message I gave about don't make decisions on the basis of money. This, these boards are pro bono. Uh, Agra yes. is pro, pro bono. But I really was interested in giving back to Africa, because I'd been working in Europe and that, and I, I really wanted to give something back to Africa. And I accepted on that basis, but I didn't know that that puts you in line to sit with people from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation. Wow. You know, I've just had an idea that I need funding on, uh, not rejected, but, you know, the, the people are approaching in South Africa saying, we don't have the capacity. And I hmm. thought to myself, okay, I'm going to Rwanda uh, in, in a couple of days' time, and Roger from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation might be able to help. And, and being able to then say, Roger, do you have 30 minutes for me over a cup of coffee when we get to Rwanda? I'd, I just need to pick your brain on something. So never discount anything on the basis of it's an NGO, it's pro bono, I'm so desperate for cash right now. You do 
you know, Jack Ma taught me something that is such a valuable lesson is do not, if you start things on the basis of a purpose, a purpose to help yes, we can. Hmm. and deal with an issue and provide a solution, the money follows, the money will follow. And, yes. and so you must let your, your decisions be about what is the purpose, what is the legacy you want to leave behind and, and let the money follow that. Yeah, there's there are two questions I want to roll into into one, and one is, um, as chair of Sasso, um, how how do you think you succeeded in that? Um, but also another question is, how have you have you have you focused on empowering women specifically? Um, as a board member, or has it been based on merit? Because that's also a very challenging yeah. thing. You don't want to end up being the, the cheerleader of, of only women issues or only black issues or only these issues. Um, how have you balanced that? Well, you know, let me answer the question first is, how did I, I think you said, how do you think, how do I think I did uh, at Sassel? For starters, mm. uh, chairing a company such as Sassel when you're not an engineer actually mm. puts tremendous pressure on you to learn. And it, it just meant, again, what I said to you about not being afraid to say to people, I'm not an engineer, you're going to have to, to teach me how you turn, uh, you know, coal into diesel and gas into diesel and, and taking the time <laughs> yes. to travel to Qatar and see the operations and that to a point where you're able to question the engineers because you understand enough. You might not understand the symbols and, you know, the, the <laughs> chemicals and chemistry that goes into it, but you understand enough to ask the right question about mm how the company should be run. As to empowering women, I think I'm, I, I classify myself more as a, a talent development person rather than gender specific. But as mm. it has turned out, because the women have been the ones that are missing more yes. around the table, it kind of push, pushes you to a point where, you know, you, you are really championing the cause of women. And I, it, it wasn't by design, uh, but it's more because, you know, women, even the ones who are joining boards are not sure about themselves, are not sure about this. So you have to be the reassuring voice, just mm. as it was it was for me to say, don't be afraid to ask the question. But apart from that, we've all got to realize that people, someone is always watching you without you even realizing yes. that, that uh, they're watching you. And I, and I will not mention names because these are people that are unknown, but one person said to me, you know, it was watching you on the Sasol board that gave me the confidence because I thought if she can do it with so much confidence and, you know, enjoyment and, and and not really being scared to manage a group of people who are, you know, not only regionally from all, you know, we had board members who had been in the oil and gas industry for all their lives, who were from the United States, the UK, Germany, yes. you name it, you know. And when someone says it was watching you handle it, with that kind of confidence and not being intimidated that I thought to myself, why am I being intimidated? So you can actually help people along even without recognizing. And I'm sure most, most of you have been in that position where somebody says it was just purely by watching you. But yeah. also, uh, and, and Nolita always reminds me of this because when I was chair of Cecil, Every time that there was a project team being put together, and of course I want meritocracy, uh, I put that yeah. 
you know, ahead of it. But meritocracy doesn't mean you know everything, doesn't mean you're ready. It says that you have the potential also to learn to be those Something. things. Mm -hmm. And I would mm -hmm. always insist that when a project team is put together, that young people are included in that team, that women are included and that mm. there are black people. And I would even go so far as to say, you know, I don't care if even their first three meetings, all they're doing is sitting around and listening. I know they will be learning. Mm. And by the fourth yeah. meeting, they will be able to. So every time a committee was put together, it became second nature because they knew when the chair goes through that list of people, they're going to say, it's not diverse enough. I don't see any young people. I don't see any women. I don't see any people of color. So make sure that those people are, are included. But I am one truly about meritocracy. And I do not close ranks around color. I don't close ranks yeah. around gender. What I will do first is I will tell you if you're messing up. But once I have told you and I've tried to guide you and you do not follow the guidance, if, if you, the bus comes your direction, I will not protect you because I will not <laughs> put things around the basis that you are black or you are, you are a woman. You need to have been able to learn from the mistakes, to listen to people guiding you and to be able to, to improve yourself and to learn yourself. So, you know, some people have said, yeah, but, you know, I did it only because it was a woman. Uh, I'm afraid I don't do that at all. Yeah. What I do do is I will spend the time with the women. I will give them feedback in private. I will make myself available to them to say, if you need help, please shout. But if none of those things have happened and, you know, the cookie crumbles at some point, nothing I can do about it. <laughs> You're on your own. So there are You're two questions. <laughs> there the are two comments more around how you've mentored some people that um, are, are participating. And so, and how proud they are, they became your mentees. And, and somebody says, but how do you approach a person of your caliber? to be a mentor. Uh, so I won't let you comment on, on that first, but there was a question that says, um, are there any failures that you can think of in your career and how you have been able to grow beyond that? Um, yeah. So you I know, think it's two parts. One, right. can you think of any failures that you, you've, you've had to tackle? Uh, for yourself more, but also it's more around mentorship. Um, we just heard how busy you are, but surely there are lots of other people of your caliber that we just all too scared to approach. Yeah. Well, you know, I have had so many failures, uh, Tina, not only as an entrepreneur, but also just in your work environment where, mm -hmm. you know, you thought that you would be able to, to bring a proposal to, to people that, that would make sense and it either didn't make sense or they poked so many holes on it that you, know, you thought either I've got to pack this and go rethink it or mm -hmm. you know, I've got to go work harder. But I'm, I'm not the kind of person who's scared of failure. So I've had many, but I stand up and I, and I dust myself. And I often ask myself, you know, was the failure my doing? Because let me tell you something that I also learned very early in my career is things where I thought I had failed. And then I discover later, let's say it's a position I wanted that I didn't mm. get. And then I discover later or a contract I wanted I didn't get that the decision had nothing to do with me or my skills, that the mm -hmm. company, uh, the priorities had changed. Let, let's take board positions, for instance. Sometimes you don't get it, and it's, be, it's not because you are not worthy. It's because the specs changed halfway through, 
is somebody says, you know, but I think we have, you know, you know that skills matrix that boards create uh, where, <laughs> you know, somebody at the time had said, we need somebody who will bring in digital uh, understanding. And halfway through, it changes to know the important thing now is ESG. So we need somebody yeah. who's climate scientist. And so you had gone halfway through with a board and suddenly you didn't make it. And I've, I've learned many times that it's not often about you, but about their own requirements changing. But I've also learned that things are not irretrievable that yes. sometimes when there's a failure, and I've just given you an example of uh, a concept that I took to a company here in South Africa where they've said, no, we just haven't got the capacity. And it knocks mm -hmm. you initially because, you know, you think that we're so excited about it. I thought we were going with this. <laughs> and then you think, you know, if they haven't got the capacity, they haven't got the capacity. So have I failed or is it just, an obstacle that I can overcome. You know what they say about obstacles being, you know, what you see when you lose sight of your dreams. And you've got to look at the failure and say, is it really a failure or is it an obstacle that I can find another way around, mm. talk to someone else, sell the concept to someone yeah. else? I've forgotten the second uh, part of the so question. So the second question is around mentorship. You know, um, right. somebody wanted to say, you know, you've, you've been a great mentor for them. But right. on the other hand, someone wanted to know, you know, how do we approach uh, people like yourselves and ask them to be our mentors? Yeah, my, my answer to people is always straightforward. One of the reasons I had put together the, the um, talent development show that was on CNBC Africa for for a couple of you know episodes, 13 episodes I think I had done earlier. Yes. Was because I had realized that the need is so big that I can never really choose the people that I will mentor. There are just too many people. At some point you're gonna say no to 20. And I'm sure many members who are on this call have had the same experience is I just haven't got the time to do it. So, you know, you try and find other ways to do it. There are people who do this as a professional thing where they are coaching and being mentors. For starters, I think I would, I would really suck as a mentor because I just <laughs> have time. And I think people learn more from me when they watch and they ask a question. But what I do say to people is I'm always available at the end of an email. Uh, I'm not very good with, with phone calls because they're intrusive. You're in the middle of a meeting and that kind of, a, but emails I answer within 24 hours. Mm. And so I often say to people, don't be shy. And, and sometimes, yes, I have broken my own rules when someone has said, please, I'm, in a, I'm facing a desperate situation. I just could do with some guidance. Mm -hmm. And very often I will do those when I'm overseas, because when you're overseas, you don't have family in the evening. You know, you're basically mm -hmm. sitting in your room and having room service. So I will say to them, OK, I'm going to be in London. I will have some free time in the evening. So call me at such a time or, you know, let's do a Zoom and I can talk you through through the issues. It is difficult because people are very Bless busy. You. And, and also there are people who do this as a professional thing. There are people who have trained to be coaches and mentors and, and do that. So there are many people who are available. Those of us who don't have a time, we do it through workshops. We do it through sharing on platforms yes. like these. I really do try to make myself available because I don't only feel an obligation to share what others also shared with me in my journey. But particularly when I have workshops with young people, it, it is amazing what I go away with because they teach you so much. So much.
mm. too. So it's it's a it's a two way street. As you share and others share, you also learn. So I would say yeah. if somebody wants someone as a mentor, the first point of call is to find coaches and mentors who are doing it professionally uh, mm. to observe the people that you, uh, you, you think could teach you something. That's how I did. I have a lot of mentors who don't even know they were my, my mentors. They would be surprised mm. if I told them. And <laughs> some of them have been surprised when I said, you know, I watched you during mm. this deal, you know, when we had a hostile takeover bid, I watched you and that taught me so much about how to defend hostile takeover bids. I learned mm. to be the chair of Sasol, particularly to work with a, a SID, a senior independent director or lead independent director, whatever you call it, because I, would, I had watched my chairman, uh, Michael Treshko at, at Unilever, how he just leveraged the strengths of his senior independent that there was never competition between them. He didn't see, um, you know, David as someone who's interfering. And that to a large extent guided how I worked with Jürgen Schremp, who was my uh, lead independent director at, at Sassol is it's very lonely at the top. You always need someone to bounce your ideas off. Mm -hmm. A good chair understands that they cannot cause an inner circle in on their True. board, otherwise you're destroying your board. So you do not talk to certain board members about things, but your lead independent director you can talk to. And so mm -hmm. you learn to, to, to use your lead independent director. And I honestly learned, by the time I, I chaired Cecil, I had watched Michael Treschko in awe, as he just, where he was weak, he leveraged his, uh, his lead independent director. I'm the deputy chair at AGRA and, and my chairman is Haile Mariam uh, Dessalane, the former prime minister of Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. Haile Mariam is a politician. He's a former prime minister of Ethiopia and he doesn't have corporate experience he has so much experience in the role he plays in dealing with governments. And there's something that I have no idea about. But he knows that when it comes mm. to the performance evaluation of the CEO, Dr. Kalibata, and that he can rely on his deputy to guide him through that process, because that's what I do in my other role. Yeah. So you learn to use the people, other people's strengths by having watched other people do it. That's so, true. Yeah, um, I'm afraid I, I will never be able to take on everyone who wants to be mentored. But I often said, if, if you really want to send an email and most people on this group will know if they have sent an email question to me, I have answered it. If I can't answer in 24 hours, I will acknowledge within 24 hours and say, I'm run off my feet, but I've got your email. I'll get back to you in a couple of days. That's great discipline. Great yeah. discipline. I'm going to put you on the spot and I'm going to ask everybody in, on, on, on this webinar that we share ideas of what we think or believe. Um, the Inanda Seminary um, Board, Alumni Board, can actually do better in so that they can get more support from us. Because they work voluntarily. They're also busy women. They are, they are also all over. The school belongs to the alumni. So how do we support them? Or what are the ideas of how we really can support Spogazi and the rest of the board to actually keep Inanda to be the home of great leaders that it's been for us. So that's a question for you, but I'd like You're everybody else to take a moment <laughs> and write something down. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, first of all, Spogazi knows and, and Gugu, uh, also knows from the other board, not the alumni board, 
mm. that I have never been shy to send an email with my thoughts and my ideas, whether it's on the constitution or, you know, disagreeing with something that a direction that they are wanting to take. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm always, uh, I read, for instance, also everything that they sent us and I mm. comment and I take the time to comment. And I think it's, it's one of the ways that we can help them. Nothing is as frustrating and I'm sure Sipogazi would feel that frustration as working hard and putting documents out there, never getting comments back yes. from people. And then it's only at the meeting that people are, you know, criticizing a comment when a document has been out on circulating for a long time. So I think the way we can support is to, to make the time to read the things mm. that they put forward to us to comment on the ideas that they are putting forward. You know, for instance, I haven't done it yet, but when I looked at that walk of fame and I would have preferred for it to be a, a, work, a walk of purpose or something, because I, I don't think we're chasing fame. We, yes. we are all about living with a purpose and the purpose being, you know, to help others to serve uh, the greater community and to serve our, our alma mater. But be that as it may, I, I, I think we need to, to look at, you know, how the, the board, you know, makes decisions about which projects they want to put on the table. What is the long-term thinking behind that project? And Google, uh, forgive me, you and Sipogas, because I've been thinking I really should ask, I support the idea of the bricks, and I think it's brilliant. But brilliant, what, happens, right. what happens, there's a bigger problem. And, and the bigger problem is that we are being priced out of the market because we're kind of in between the traditional private schools that are at 300, 400,000. At 75,000, yeah. we don't compete with them. We offer something that's very good. But, but it's almost like, you know, when, when I talk to friends about if you had a house in the township and you overcapitalized, you mm. get to a point where you've got to give it away if you need to get out because mm. the people who can afford your 700,000 can buy in a suburb at 700,000. Mm. And so they've got to think uh, at that point, should I really spend the 700,000 in, in Guamashu or seven, spend the 700,000 in New Germany? And I use that as a, as a wild example. So, yeah. so the bigger question is that we all have to put our heads and wrap our heads around is at what point have we now priced ourselves out of the market that we were aiming for to a point where now the, the, the game is, well, you know, I can take them to Durban Girls High or Westfield Boys Girls High mm. at that price. So this, this issue is not going to get away. The, 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 the bricks are a brilliant idea and we all need to support that because, you know, with every strategy, there's a long-term strategy and a short-term. So hmm. the short term is very clear and it's, it's a brilliant strategy. What is the long term one to address that problem? So I think we need to learn to engage with the team uh, when they put their thoughts out to us to give some yes. constructive builds and say, actually, brilliant idea in the short term. What are we thinking about doing for the long term when we have to raise the fees again yeah. or you know, when we have to build another hostel so I think you know in short I'm saying let's let's engage with the documents they put out there let's engage mm -hmm. with the projects that they suggest because you know it's it's a think tank of a few but when they put it out and we think there's something that we could contribute that could make the project bigger better faster uh let's reach out that's true 
and and the responsibility of course on them is is to be open to suggest mm. suggestions and open to to ideas that are not necessarily group think uh and are different from their ideas yeah. which which and and i must compliment Sipogas. i'm not saying it just because she's here she really <laughs> has proven herself to be open to new ideas and open to to constructive criticism and she always responds so thank very you much sir. and working late nights yeah. um thank you very much everyone um and and and, and my hope is that this walk of purpose doesn't only just stop in Feb's Hall, but it goes all the way because we, we should be in a position where we never stop buying the bricks to continue building and, and fixing the school. Says me who looked at it and I thought, what a great idea and completely quickly forgot uh, to, to follow up with it. But, you know, I, I, I then thought about it and I was saying to Spokas, this is something that I really said I will do and I have to just follow through. So yeah. I think that's really what we have to do. But I like your idea of saying, then please respond. At least give them some feedback. Feedback is a gift. Absolutely. And there's been, there's been quite a lot of feedback uh, on, on, on the chats. All I can say, Kixonia, is keep shining where you are. We are absolutely, absolutely proud. And an opportunity to almost have this, you know, uh, across the miles conversation has been such an honor um, and a privilege for, I think even for people who didn't raise questions or didn't ask anything, um, I think for everybody, it's, it's something that, you know, we'll sit back and go, she actually said, you know, never apologize. That's what we were taught at Inanda. And we could express ourselves. And slowly, but we have to give back with the NGOs, with Inanda work, with the churches, with whatever we must find time because only concentrating on, on our corporate lives, so to say, is not enough. I've learned a lot from you. And I keep learning just from observing you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, members. Please open up um, your cameras if you can, so that we can just say shine. It's always going to be difficult to ask everybody yeah. to, oh, there's everyone. Thank you, members. Thank you very much. Really you, appreciate members. it. And we say shine, Hixonia, shine. Thank you. Thank you. And, and but, truly, you know, you are a pro just such an awesome group of women. And I hope you all continue to shine because every Inanda girl that I know is shining somewhere. And, and maybe I actually boast too much about Inanda girls <laughs> that people must be bored with me because it's always, yep, you know, she's an Inanda girl, but, but just to leave a last word is to always remember, you know, a wise, very wealthy man said to me that the burden of privilege is humility and service to others. And we have been so privileged and it, it is really important that we are not only humble, but are mm -hmm. open to serving others. So thank you very much. And Tina, you've, you've been an, an amazing host and you've made my job easy in, in how you frame the questions and, and how you facilitated this conversation. So thank you to you. And you're also one of the women that I have watched, uh, you know, had the privilege of being close to you when you were at Standard Bank and I was forming Ayavuna. And so thank you for being cheerleader also. To, to our project and, and the things that I was pursuing. So thank you and Sipogazi, thank you very much. Thank you very much to ISAA board. Thank you, um, Sipogazi, thank you, you and your team. Well done, thank you very much. Thanks ladies, we'll thank keep you. chatting and let's build that walk of purpose.
Absolutely. Yes, thank you very much. I like I like that. That's the new name for it now. Walk of Pebbles going forward. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it sounds clumsy, much. but I'm sure you can clean it up better. <laughs> no, I love it because our principal, our principal when I was there in 1981 to 85 was Mrs. Calder. Right. Uh, and yes. she used to say, members, you must walk with pebbles. So right. Right. she used to say that to us as members when we were yeah. there. Walk with yeah. pebbles. So I think you're right. You should actually call it the walk uh, of pebbles. Absolutely. Thank you so very thank much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Good night, so I learned a lot. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank Bye. you very much. Thanks for taking all the time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.